good idea. It's the morning Joe to your morning Joe. It's the blue collar to your blue collar. It's the lab coat to your scientists. Speaking of scientists, y'all want to learn something today? <laughs> This is how I want to introduce the show. Come on, G. Don't make fun of me. It's not nice <laughs> to do that. Welcome to Good Idea, the podcast where we make emo music and shit <laughs> all the time. That's what we do here. It's what we do, but today we're doing something else. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Good Idea, the very fun and good idea podcast where we often have ideas and philosophical discussions and goofs. Today, we will probably have all of those things, uh, but we are introducing to you in this particular audio file slash podcast episode, whatever you'd like to call it, uh, the 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 uh, lore and background for houses of bone and lamplight. I don't know if I totally said that I pronounced <laughs> yeah, the name correctly. Right. right words. Fuck yeah. <laughs> the, the the background for the uh, houses of bone <laughs> and lamplight. That's what we're talking about. Uh, uh, we're going to do some lore and whatnot. We have Bill Smith here, the creator uh, of Houses of Bone and Lamplight. G. Daly, a uh, regular co-host on our podcast, is another creator of uh, Houses of Bone and Lamplight. I wouldn't this say game creator. is something I've... You've created some of the lore. You are one of the creators right. on it, and I don't care who invented the thing. I'm not going to let my podcast not credit you. Um, <laughs> this Bill is, won't this credit is no, me, so at least you do. <laughs> <laughs> I'll credit you. That's what that's what I'm saying. So that what I I I, I, I be, I'm a believer that if your idea is on the thing. Oh, there's noise happening upstairs. Fuck that. It's fine. That's annoying. Um. No, but it's annoying because I hear it in my headphones Fair. and it makes me like, because then I realize that I'm going to have to listen to it later. It's like not even for the listener because I'll take it out for the listener. Maybe I won't take that one out just because it's part of the story now. <laughs> but like, it's just never fun. It's never fun. Anyway, if you if you if your idea stink is on something, that's you're one of the creators of that thing. I mean, it's 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 humanity. We're yeah. everything is so much bigger than each each of us, you know? Yeah. But that's 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 beside the point. Uh Bill Smith and G Daly are both creators. Hello. Uh just wanted to drop in here really quick and add uh, add another thank you that I think uh, I think we failed to do during the episode. This is a thank you to Caitlin Porter, who is also responsible for a lot of the lore creation in Houses of Bone and Lamplight, as well as the the uh beautiful like setup and uh drafting work of the rule book that we're using uh, thank you so much caitlin porter for helping make this awesome game and episode and episodes to follow possible uh back to the show bill smith is the is the primary creator of of houses of bone and lamplight we have bill here all the way from lovely london england i think it is he lives in i think um <laughs> chester. Uh, chester and then he replies indeed <laughs> <laughs> that or or with the actual location in which he lives. Yeah, but nobody actually uh, knows where Chester too. is, so London is fine. <laughs> it's entirely the wrong London place. Is fine. <laughs> uh, but okay, so Bill Bill is here with us to to answer our questions and to tell us about lore. And then later, after this lore episode audio file, we're gonna play this fucking game that's so awesome and cool. Uh, uh, it, without further ado. 
Bill Smith, your host for this episode. <laughs> Hello, um, I would like to say thank you very much for this honour. The reign of terror begins now. Jesus Christ. Uh, <laughs> couldn't resist. So, uh, I'll start with the basics and I'll start scared. answering questions as we go along. This is a game about magic, about life, and about, well, all sorts. In general you are part of what is known as the world in between. Uh, the world in between, um, no one is entirely sure why people call it that, but it is, there's a variety of different like places, there's a variety of different locations, like there is, um, there is the Wildwood, which is where the Fae and the Fair Folk come from. You have the World Beneath Glass, which is um, a reflection version of our world. You have the Ouroboros Road, which is a ever onward um, highway, essentially, that is made from the spine bones of um, Jormungand. You've got all the realms of the gods. You have all the various realms and little places of the gods. You have all these different places, and where you are is referred to as the world in between. And that's sort more, of the term more what you are yeah because where you are is earth yeah earth in the modern day now magic everyone can access a little bit of magic everyone has those little moments of being capable of being magical when you do a performance that makes a whole audience completely alive and electric that's a form of magic when you can say something so charismatic or so interesting that you can make someone like fall in love or in utter rage that's magic people the stories you have all the time of mothers or people just lifting cars off of children because they're like of that adrenaline rush can also be described as magic Every culture in the world has some idea of what magic is, and every single one of those is true. It is just, there are some people who can access a bit more than others. There is a thing called essence. Essence is everywhere, and we take it in, we hold it, and we release it. Those of you who can do magic are alive with a capital A. You are bright and vibrant. You somehow stand out, even if it's by how anonymous you are, or it's by how, like, just something about you is different. And you are awake to magic, and you've learned how to channel it in a certain direction. In the world in between, you have the Exiles, who uh, were celestial beings that can no longer return to where they came from. You have the demon kin who possess people and make their bargains. You have the fae who are pure magic, pure magic elemental beings who cause their mischief and play their games. You have the undead, the people who died and never got better. The ghosts and the zombies. You have the vampires who died and did get better. Is that <laughs> kind of? They, 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 yeah, they, they feed off of the life essence, the blood of others to stain themselves. You have all these different factions, all these different things, and the magical world has existed alongside the mundane. There are a variety... It was said that there was a larger... Magic was more prevalent in the past, but due to... The Age to, of Legend? Yes. The Age of Legend. Mythology. Every mythology is true. Every culture's idea of, of stuff that happened in the past is real. And if you ask someone how, like, how a certain type of spellcaster works, um, it is sometimes best to ask the culture in question. Magic in the Age of Legend was prevalent and easy to access. That went to pot. 
um, when a particular person became a god. A long time ago, there was a person called Merlin, and Merlin was the god of magic. He had won a challenge and became the god of magic. He was deposed by one of his students, a man who named himself the Crow King in a rather pretentious fashion, and decided to prevent anybody else from stop from attempting to overthrow him, he reduced the magic of the world so that no one could reach his level. This had a series of knock-on effects. This made the dragons infertile. It made the fairies give birth to the fae which led to the Fae rebelling against their parents. It led to the near immortality of some spellcasters basically vanishing. The world became a little darker and magic became a little quieter. And several centuries afterwards, this is the world you live in. Magic is still there. Wonders of the old age still exist. There are cities where you will find dragons that reside in shops or running libraries. You reside in a place where gods walk among you, but the world's a little bit dimmer to what it used to be. That is the world in between and the place you find yourself in. That's the basics. The Houses of Bone Lamplight, though not necessarily as relevant for the game I'm going to be running, is the magical society of Britain. In, and the Commonwealth. As it used to spread out among the Empire, but what I generally speaking do with the Commonwealth is that there are they are an option among other bits and pieces. Canada chose to take take upon the take upon themselves the houses. Australia may not have. I have to talk to um, an Australian to do that. I don't know what else is part of the Commonwealth. India. Because South, I'm South American. Africa. Um a yeah, lot of places. There would be Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, possibly Honduras. I believe yeah, they were also they, under British control. <laughs> Um, basically, the idea being is that with the Commonwealth, they stepped back from being the only option to being a one option that can be taken. The houses themselves were essentially a collection of basically mystery cults based off of different ideas of magic, all working together, because in 1664, they basically went, you know what we hate? Witch hunts? Let's have a union? Is the simplest way of describing how it functioned. Well, it wasn't just that, though. They were also trying to overthrow the vampire rule. Yeah, the vampiric monarchy were in charge of the magical world for a long time. And basically, um... With uh, the English Civil War, with like the com with the Commonwealth and then all that sort of thing, um, magic took a lot of serious hits because of Puritanism and because of various other things. So they created the houses as a means to fight back against the vampires as to kind of keep each other safe. They tried to spread that idea around the world because they thought that would be a good idea, and some places rebelled. Um, America, for instance. America got very touchy about anything British, and so the English decided that we'd leave. Um, yeah, decided. I mean, you were very well persuaded. We were incredibly well persuaded to leave. Um, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, big, great balls of fire coming out of people's fists because magic was a part of that war and every war. There is a magical aspect to every war. Every aspect has had like little magical fights in it. In America, which is where this, this game, when I run it, will be set, we have the Cabals. Small groups, small organizations... Kind of, uh, rather than being uh, houses which are based on what you can do and what your... It's like in Harry Potter, what, what you think is most important to you. It's, it's That's what the houses are kind of based on. In America, the cabals are mostly just based on where you live 
and what your job is. So for instance, in Austin, Texas, there are two large cabals and several smaller ones. The two large cabals are a protection cabal and a justice cabal. The justice cabal runs a magical branch of the police. The protection cabal runs protection of the citizens of Austin. Portland is not quite as fleshed out. There is one cabal that protects the forest because there's a bunch of magical shit there. And they mostly just kind of keep mundanes from seeing it. Uh, there is a cabal that is mostly just undead or death god worshippers, uh, warlocks, and they are... Uh, honestly, they're mostly secret keepers. Most of their job is to keep the veil from being torn. The veil being the term used for... Um, it's the masquerade. It is it's what hides the, the magic, yeah, from the mundanes. Um... Yeah, also in Portland, uh, there is another, like, we've not, it's not been fully fleshed out, but there is one cabal, which... Ah, yes. The Coachman. The Coachman. Uh, the Coachman are, um, basically cab drivers and Uber drivers. Um, they are the idea of a bunch of spellcasters who are, who drive... They know the city so well that they basically are the information brokers and the transportation of the city of the magical city of the magical part of the city so you be a mem if you um basically uh, have a membership with the coachman what they will do is you phone a number and one of their people will show up to pick you up or drop you off somewhere and you can kind of hire them for rumors and stuff like and that. as is the role of the cabbie they know the goings on of the city because they hear everything from the front of their cab. To give you a general idea about cabals and about that sort of thing. Will they recommend um, me stocks? Can I get stock recommendations from these cab drivers? <laughs> <laughs> that, that was just a little funny joke about getting stock <laughs> recommendations. So you, you guys keep on going. I don't know. I have this book by the guy who who runs Trader Dot University. It's like a number one best selling book on Amazon about like stock investing, and he talks about how it's Amazing. really bad uh, advice to ever to, to ever take stock advice from cab drivers or hairstylists or uh, <sighs> cutters because apparently that's a very common thing. So, like, it, it, like he, he as a rule, we... he'll never buy a stock if it's recommended to him by a cab driver. That's hilarious. <laughs> Have we covered most of the lore that you think? That's the general overview, and I can I can answer more particular questions, questions if as you we guys go have on from them. here. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. That was really helpful and fun to listen to, and very cool. Um, I was I I feel like this thing has big Neil Gaiman energy. I don't remember if I said that on the the last time we talked about this on the podcast. Do you guys have any questions? Um, I can go into some particulars about, like, aspects of, um, the things you're, like, some of your characters are involved in, so I can go into, I'll go into the, uh, about the Fae and the Wild Court. That would be fantastic. Yeah, yeah I'll go into the, I'll go into Perfect. the Fae in particular, the Wild Court. That's me, so I'm a Fae of the Wild Court. Yes. So, there are five courts of the Fae. There is the Undercourt, the Wild Court, the Sky Court, the Street Court, and, and the, the Bloom. Bloom. Most people will only ever interact with the Sky and the Street. They are the two courts that constantly change and constantly war with each other. Now, to go a little bit further back, the Fey, when they were first born, were a novelty to their parents, the fairies. They were a curiosity, they were strange, but like, they were, they were useful. Ugh, fucking fairies, man. And the fairies were... Did bitches? Not, yeah, um, I was gonna go more poetic, but yeah, they were bitches. Um, the fairies make me deeply uncomfortable. Every time I have to fight a fairy, it makes me want to die, because they're terrifying. Yeah, imagine they're essentially these reality warping entities that have very little morality, and um, 
feel very entitled to do whatever they want. Kind of like the Crow King. And they had the so the fairies when the Age of Legend ended, the the children they had with each other came out as fae instead. No, there was some sort of weird side effect of the magic that the first seven born of each of the different species has some kind of effect. Like had was like a middle ground between the fairies and the fae in the case of these. So these were the the monarchs, as they later got called. The first seven born. You had a uh, Zebelian. Uh, the firstborn of the Fae, who would later be the Warden of the Undercourt. The Undercourt are the Jailers. They are the ones who keep the Fairies imprisoned in his palace of the Grey Fort. Don't forget about the War Criminals. Because it's not just Fairies in the Grey Fort. Also, as I've been reminded, inside the Grey Fort are also... There was a great war. The fairies had raised up against the... or the fae raised up against the fairies, attempting to gain their freedom, to stop them from being basically treated as cannon fodder and novelty. And... they went to various people for aid to fight, and some of them were spellcasters. And some of those spellcasters went a bit too far. They were referred to as the Branded afterwards. They were marked with the Fey language for the word, for the crimes they have committed. And they also were basically cursed with eternal life and locked in the Grey Fort. They are put alongside the fairies. Um, most fae as a culture will tend to have a, their surname based off of a deed. Younger fae will not. They have to earn it. It's a, it's a name based off of a deed. This vaguely came from um, nicknames and titles given to the monarchs during the war. So to use Zebelian, for example, he is referred to as Banebearer. Because... Ooh, because he's a badass. <laughs> because um, there was the, it took too long for the armies to come and find them. So the fairies' forces are coming down the way, and Zebelian looked and saw that his reinforcements were not going to get there in time and it was going to be a massacre. So he told a human friend of his to strap him into a suit of cold iron armor, which burned him, and it hurt. He took a blade of cold iron in one hand, a mace in the other, and he marched into the fairy army and started wading through them in agony the entire time. To give you an indication about how badass this guy is, um, he's, there's a reason that iron is called the bane. Um, he learned how to master, how to maybe not be unharmed from the from iron, but knows how to weaken it, how to make the effects be less effective to the fay of his court. But they are the law. Then you have, because we'll go in order of it, you have the Wild Court, who is headed up by uh, Thessalus. Thessalus. Uh, Thessalus, uh, Swift Edge, the Wild Knave, the son of Robin Goodfellow, of Puck from Midsummer Night's Dream, for anybody else was was actually the one who started the rebellion. Yeah. Um, 
he was the one who started the rebellion. He is the one who um, tore down the banners of his... Um, he has a patchwork coat that was made from torn up heraldic banners of fairies. He is a trickster. He is someone who um, enjoys making mischief, and his court does so. I love him. He's the bane of my existence. Um, the wild knave and the wild queen. And iron is the bane of <laughs> his. Um... The Wild Court are, well, very literally the Wild Card. They show up um, to places, they will sometimes incite rebellion, they will turn up and they will perform, they will sometimes... They they cause mischief, they're tricksters. Well, there's them. a reason the traveling groups of the Wild Court are called troops. Yes, the... Uh, they, are, they are troops, they are performers. Um... Uh, performers and hunters. A lot of the time, you will see the ones that reside in the Wildwood will, like, ride around searching for, like, things to go after. And in the... In our world, in the human world, you will usually have the Wild Court go off and find their fun. They don't usually stick around in the human world very long. They, no, they tend no. to stick to the Wildwood. But they're wild, so they do whatever they want as well. <laughs> um, the one thing about them that makes the little distinction is that um, the knave had a bet with another monarch. Because he was one of the finest swordsmen that the Fae had ever seen, another monarch basically told him that um, without his sword fighting ability, um, he wouldn't be nearly as impressive. Which monarch? The mother. I know that. I'll. I shall get. Uh, the mother, Illyrial, who I will get to um, in a moment. So he put away his swords and said that he would. I would not use them. I will not. And many of his court decided to do the same in honor of their monarch. I have a friend who plays a wild court that rather than carrying around weapons, carries around these coins made of fey glass and also powdered fey glass and uses those as weapons. Uh, the powdered fey glass can literally be turned into a bomb. It's pretty cool. Um, yeah, they got creative. Um, culturally speaking, Fae have uh, their stories written upon their skin. They have marks that sort of swirl about their bodies. Um, the uh, other Fae, when they see them, they can read and learn about their history. The Wild Court have the tendency that they have marks over their hands and over their feet. Because they can channel their man, they can channel some magic through those markings, so they can basically hit very hard. They, their punches get harder because of the channeling. It's really fucking cool. I do not believe, though, Aiden's. Uh, I don't think Aiden's character has channeling, so that's yeah, not an aspect we'll get to see. She probably still has the marks on her fingers, though. Yes, yeah, she probably. Yeah, probably Lisa. Yeah. Um. Do I have channel? I might have channeling. I almost certainly have the marks on my finger. Let me see if I have channel. Do I, have I don't think I have channeling. I think you're right. Um, which is fine. Not all of them. You're right. Not all of them have it. But yeah. it, um. Uh. So yeah. So that's the wild court. Um. Hell yeah. The sky court. Because I'll go through it in. I'll go through an order of. Oh, just the youngest. Make them a little bit shorter. I'm working on it, yeah. sorry dear. Um, the Sky Court is the Court of Aspiration. They are nobility, they are the ones who basically are build tall skyscrapers. They're the stereotype you would expect of like slightly flouncy fey. Um, most of their titles are very much like um, a lot of noble titles. They're very sort of live in opulence and beauty. The and Duchess Lantalathiel. 
of the Court of Swirling Birds. What is her title? Um, what was it? A uh, cloud catcher or something like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, something real flouncy. <laughs> um, is an incredibly extra individual. In sharp contrast, you have the street court, who are their enemies as much as they have enemies. Rivals. Rivals. Um, they're very much the court of. Well, how do you just how do you describe them? Since, since oh, you're asking me? Yeah. I guess because they're my baby. Um, they're like... If a hippie and a motorcycle gang had a baby. Um, they're amazing and I love them. They, they, they walk the streets. They... They run across the rooftops barefooted. They wear leather and grass and cotton and they carry swords and baseball bats and spears and they shout like they're ruthless and they're warrior like and they're nothing like the sky court and they're they're tribal and i love them very much and i have a character who is a part of that and and it's very important to me because i helped create them a little bit um they're just rough they're rougher on the edges compared to it's it's I don't want to say it's peasants versus nobility because it's not. They're both very noble, but it's 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 rough versus soft. Um, and then the last court is the Bloom Court, headed up by the Mother Illyrial, who is um. While the Undercourt deals with the past, it deals with the fairies, it deals with the baggage that the Fae left behind, the Bloom Court deals with... The future. It looks after the children, it looks after... The elves. Yeah, the elves, which is the byproduct of a human... And um, a Fae, having, having a yeah. child. They... Um, break with a lot of tradition among the Fae that they use bows and arrows, they're healers, they... Uh, her palace is a place called the Nursery, which imagine... Imagine a greenhouse about the size of Versailles. She's a mother and a gardener. Um... The Fae... And you can't... Oh. You can't look at her without falling in love. It's not a magical thing, she's just that beautiful. Um, and just a very nice person. Honestly. <laughs> but she is the one who made the bargain with Thessalis, um, basically saying, well, you're only a swords, but you're only a swordsman. Like, that's why you're so powerful. So They were teasing each other. Basically. And she made a bet with him that lasted, what, a thousand years? A mm, couple of hundred. A couple hundred years. So that's the... Apologies, that was a bit lengthy, but that is the fate. In a, in semi-brief. Um, that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Who else do we need to cover? What else is there that we need well, to know to understand the campaign we're about to go on? The rest of you are... I'm a fair folk, which means I uh, was... As a, a fair folk that's only a couple hundred years old, I'm actually rather young. I'm very old for human standards, but I'm actually rather young in terms of the fairies. Um, I was not born in the Age of Legend. I was only born in like the 1500s. Um, I was born of probably two banshees or 
however banshees are created, honestly. Um, usually the fair folk are created by, they're either the non, the, the non-nobility fairies, or they're created by a fairy having a child with a human. So I was created one of those two ways. Most likely, as I am so young, a fairy having a child with a human. Um, I just put a chip in my mouth because I'm an idiot. Bill, please shake over. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, uh, the fair folk in regards of um, the fae, they were... Brownies would be servants. the servant. They, they were the servants. They were servants and uh, soldiers. soldiers. They were expendable, basically. Um, and a lot of what happened is that the Fae... When the Fae overthrew their parents, the Fair Folk took their side, most of them. Yeah, and what they got in exchange was they were freed from the obligation to serve the Fae. The fairies. Oh, well, yeah. Well, fairies and the fae, yeah. basically. They, they... Um, now, basically, a fair folk can choose whether or not they serve someone. Brownies, more often than not, will choose to, because brownies are just made like that. Um, they love it, and they live for it. And brownies are often butlers or waitresses, or they own restaurants or nurseries or... Concierges of hotels. They love it. They love taking care of you, and they know everything you need at the moment you need it. So there's this one named Annabelle who uh, owns a restaurant, and if you come in and ask her... Like if you come in and say what's good today, she'll hand she'll she'll give you a plate of your absolute favorite food and the thing you need most at that moment. So if you're sick and you're cold, you get a hot cup of soup. If you are wanting something rich and filling, you get a plate of steak per perfectly cooked. Um, she's wonderful. And there was one time where her husband needed a shotgun and just happened to have one on hand, um, in his restaurant, which was bizarre as fuck, but whatever. Um, uh, one example I had is that the Doolahan, so like the head, like the headless horseman, I had them as a biker gang. Oh, they're they fun. Were, they were a bunch of, they were like a full blown biker gang of, of guys. With these, they can like, still serve the Fey as warriors if they want to, or, they can ride around as a biker gang on their own. Uh, the Catchy, they often live with or alongside uh, street court because they're very similar in nature. Um, they're just rough and rowdy and ready to fight. Uh, yeah, you get all sorts. So, so there is a wide variety. So most variants of um, fairies from mythology, generally speaking, are down as fair, fair folk. folk. Um, I'm playing a Banshee. Bill, would you like to go into detail about what that is? We just created Banshees, like, three days ago. So... <laughs> so, here we go, guys. So, Banshees, in particular, they are... Um, they are beings which... Uh, they tend to, to bind themselves to a family. And they are heralds of... Fortune, misfortune, and death. So they generally speaking are like they will warn their families if they're going to Well, if they're going to die. Um They're very good advisors. Um and other bits and pieces like that. But they some fa some banshees can decide to be like that weird cousin that keeps showing up at all the funerals. Or they will be like some sort of like family legend of like, oh, be careful that she's going to turn up and it's going to be terrifying. Um, most most fair folk tend to adhere to the old ideas of seely and unseely. So being more sort of neutral, a bit more helpful and being a bit more sort of chaotic or a little bit more sort of inhuman. Banshees don't often become unseely. Banshees aren't often unseely. They always start as seely, and they only become unseely if something distressing happens to their family or to them. You'll learn more about that in-game, because I'm playing an unseely banshee. Um, 
I'll run through little bits and pieces. Uh, the mages. The mages. Mages. So mm. let's go specifically technomancers. Yes. Um, a little bit yeah, of background boy. about mages, like two sen- sentences. So. Pathwalkers are one of the families of magic, one of the seven families. Um, Pathwalkers, and who are, which is the other name for a mage, um, are specialists. They They, choose their path. Yeah, you you would have awakened to magic, and you would have had different magics every day until you decided, no, this is what I want to do and where I want to be. And then your magic locks, and that is your magic. So the path of technology which is what uh, George's character is on, uh, um, they, that path would have begun with, like... The age of technology? Well, um, yeah, it's the it's, um, age of, like, the in, like, industrial age, like, making machinery. Yeah. Like, older variants of technomancers or the, te- or the technology mages would have been stuff like they would have been like engineers the and earliest would've... technomancer and i say that with air quotes would have been the guy who created the wheel but technically i would say that is not a technomancer because it's not like technology it's it's the the path is dramatic it's engineering but yeah the path has changed dramatically from like inventing to engineering and computers and Specifically technology, specifically computer science, and that kind of thing. Yeah, it's that um, it's dramatically increased because um, mages always like tinkering with their with their magic. They always like trying to work out how the path works for them. They basically have go. They have one trick, and they're really, really narrowed in how good they are with it. This is why, uh, George, I actually invented a skill for you. Um, just so you, it, uh, on your sheet you have, um, blind spot. Oh, you did? That wasn't a thing before? No, I made it up. Uh, I made it up for George. I thought it would be fun. It is fun. Oh. Blind spot basically means you can create blind spots in cameras and recording equipment. They just don't <laughs> see you. <laughs> You're welcome. I would say if <laughs> you use you. a sig, a sig with that, you could yeah. probably hide other people from it too. Oh no, yeah. no, that's absolutely what it is. You you create blind spots in cameras. Um, uh, I you are probably a, a very good thief. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, out of the skills I gave you. Hang on, I sure I've got the base one here. So, so you know the damnation of blood. Oh my god. Is basically, oh hey man, screw your technology and everything it stands for. You point at something and you brick it. This includes <laughs> guns. You can break, uh, like, more, like, if someone has like a semi automatic or a machine gun, you just go bam and it breaks. Um, you basically. You could it. literally drop a plane out of the sky if you can see it. If you put enough magic into it. If you put enough it, magic into it, yeah. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Um, I would say most of the time that would take more than one Technomancer to do. Yes, um, because in the Age of Legend, totally easy for someone to do on their own. Now There were no planes in the Age of Legend. No, but if there was. Um, create power has a couple of different things. One, this includes the fact Oh my god, you're a human generator. I forgot about this one. Yeah, yeah. This basically includes, if you picked up a <laughs> light bulb, you could just light the light bulb in your hand. You, could- you can charge your phone by just holding it <laughs> but also what you can do is if someone like cuts off the power you can just go cool rooms on or you can literally touch someone and slightly tase them if you have a conductive material you can basically do more lethal you can cackle prod a guy so i have a friend who decided she wanted to make a technomancer who literally just carries around a light bulb and when she has an idea she just holds it above her head and lights it <laughs> Oh, create man. create information oh basically God. means what you can do is you can go if someone goes you're not on the list you can wave your hand and literally just go yep there is the man in black probably loves technomancers absolutely um look again no no literally ba- you, yeah, you can much. you can basically 
um, you can basically straight up create information because that's all technology is, is zeros and ones. You can, you can like, you could, for example, if you had like an interface, just think and write up information if you wanted to at that skill. If you wanted to go... You can dictate to your computer and make it write a Word document for you. Yeah. Um, you could, for example... Um, uh, one skill I'm probably going to add to the Technomancer's ability is basically um, just being able to like just completely like static out. For someone who doesn't know shit about computers, you're really good at making magic computer stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, this is really impressive. And I also barely know anything about computers. I only took like so yeah. So basically, so basically magic allows you to be a bit creative and a bit weird. Blind spot. I've already explained. Search engine is literally. I need to find this information. I need to look for something. So you start using your magic to start going. Your brain is a dial-up connection. Yeah. <laughs> you you can just go, okay, people have Wi-Fi. People have, like, social media things. I need to look for this information. Google. And you Google. It's a Google. You have go you have magical Google in your head. You can just Oh, my God. Google. Imagine it's whatever like... it was. Im imagine in the early 2000s when instead of Google... You had a magical Ask Jeeves in your head. Yeah, but <laughs> um, other, th other things that exist, by the way, is like, uh, you don't You're have- You're on my hair, babe. Sorry, darling. Um, you don't, is you have like, um, you have things like uh, create and manipulate signal. So you can like li literally, oh my God, there's no signal. Yeah, there is. Or if somebody cuts the phone line, you can create a phone signal. Yeah, you could, yeah. If someone like cuts the phone line, you could pick up like a, a dial-up phone and just make it work. Like you are, that is what your pattern does. <laughs> you don't have that particular trick, but um, I They're thought badass. I thought they would. They, I thought they felt appropriately watchdogs enough that you would be able to have some ideas for it. I've been playing the game, so yeah, I've already got some ideas run. <laughs> um, sorcerers, just to move over to... Um, Jeff, are you there? Hey, what's up? Right, so you you character hunts um, demons, vampires, generally speaking, things that go bump in the night, right? That's right. Cool. Um... Uh, so, uh, vampires, um, you can mess them up quite a lot, but basically as long as, if you put a stake in their heart, they're paralyzed. If you take their head off, okay. they die. In terms of lore you need to know about sorcerers, you're basically a magical powerhouse. You collect magic, you grab bag magic, basically. You can do pretty much anything that pretty much anybody else can do, as long as you have the ability to learn it. As long as you can, like, read a book or have somebody teach you how to do this magic, you can do it. And the best way cool. that a lot of sorcerers learn is by connecting to the city. That's also how they get their magic. They... I would say sap it from the city, kind of. It, they, I mean, they have an exchange with the city. Basically, they, the city loves them and they love the city. Um, so th they're a part of their home and their magic is entwined with that. Sweet. I think that's basically it. Yeah, that's S pretty much all. That's pretty much all there is to sorcerers. Um, they're pretty rock and roll um, and they're scary. <laughs> So. Hell yeah. Uh, I'm ready to start one of the people. Well, are. warlocks. Hello. Uh, yeah, so warlocks are, warlocks serve a god, a god or a, like a relic or a, like, you know, a, a grimoire. Sword. You yeah. find a patron, that patron gives you power. In particular, your patron being trivial, the god of questions, answers, and knowledge. Um, means that his whole deal is he likes people asking the right questions and he likes people looking for information. You get your power from him. Um, you can access and talk to him. Um, you may not be as entirely as well versed in the man. You are a frog. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think we'll get more into that later. <laughs> we'll get more into that as we go along. So that's smart. That's a great place to end I agree. the Absolutely. episode. 
bonus episode the lore bonus episode thanks you guys for listening have a good night thanks for listening okay. to the lore <laughs> bonus episode good night so should we stop recording and start a new one yes this episode is really interesting too because it just sort of ends